I was reading an article by a preacher who was written around 1980, early in the year. And he made me realize, I hadn't spoken on this in a while, though we at one time had taught classes on, on it and spoken on it. I want to read to you what he wrote, and you'll see where we're going. He wrote, my personal physician and an elder in the church was speaking to the assembly on the subject of anxiety. He said, and he quotes him, anxiety and worry are greater threats to our lives, our health and physical welfare, than is cancer. Of all those under care of physicians today, over 65% are there because of worry and anxiety. Our hospitals would be more than filled to capacity to accommodate sufferers of nervous disorders due to worry. As a result, this has become a generation of distraught people governed by tranquilizers, unquote. He then said, and he calls his name Dr. Wise, had statistics to back up what he said. Well, I mind you, that's 80 years, 80 years ago, 1980. If that was the case then, and it was, I used to preach a sermon on the aspirin age, but I had to change it to the Valium age because it got worse and needed something stronger. But nevertheless, when you look round about you and when you conceive of all that's going on, then no wonder with people tending to give up God and everything pertaining to him and don't know much about what they are, that there is, there's no wonder that it all develops as it has. I read of a fellow saying, preach the sermon, you have to think about it for a minute. He says, why worry and go to hell when you can go to hell without it? Now you have to think about that for a minute. The fact of the matter is, worry is taking thought about that which you can do nothing about. Anxiety is like worrying while you're in the bed of fire ants. <laughs> so we all have to battle those things. I suppose it's harder on some people than others. There's a lot of things about bringing our lives in subjection to Christ that challenge us. And so I thought I would, since I haven't done this in a while, uh, deal with this. Remind ourselves of some things we probably already know. Keeping in mind our definition, worry is taking thought about that which you can do nothing about. Now, you may have to think for a while, ponder a thing before you reach the stage, in all honesty, where you're well, at this point. And it may be at that point. It might something happen later on. But at this point, I've done all I can do. I can't do any more. There's nothing I can do to change the thing. Now, life is a lot like that. And learning when it's time to say that and act accordingly and when it's not is a big development in your psychological stability. And I have always believed that God is the best psychologist. After all, he put us all together. He knows how we work. And while we don't study the Bible to learn how uh, we work mentally and emotionally. It's there because God cannot address man in a book designed to save his soul and carry him to heaven and not address how man's drawn away from God and what happens when one has proper faith in God and godly things. And that then gets on the area of worry. Paul is an example for those who desire to overcome anxieties. And he put it this way, and you all are aware of this if you're Bible students of Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. He said, I press toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now let's stop the back of it and notice Paul is speaking as a Christian. Where is he as far as his relationship to God? In Christ Jesus. So that implies his understanding of, as we talked about even this morning, 
that God is with those who are his children in a way he's not with the rest of the world. And there are blessings for the faithful child of God in the church that don't exist for everybody else. So that's important to understand. <laughs> then going back to the first of it, he said, forgetting those things which are behind. Well, forgetting, how do I forget? That's quite, a, <laughs> quite an accomplishment to be able to forget things that are behind. I think you would have to say that since our memories call back all sorts of things, that he's talking about whether it be sins or whether it be even faithful accomplishments. You can't let those things hinder you as far as what you do from here toward the future as to however long you have on this earth. But especially does it have to do with those things that haunt us. I wish I'd done this earlier in life. I would have missed this. I wish I'd paid attention to that. I wish I'd dodged this. I wish, the I wish, I wish. And that's where it goes. There may be a lot of truth to what you're thinking. But at the same time, what good does it do unless it causes you to not make those same mistakes? When I was, I hadn't even, well, I wasn't even preaching, even Sunday preaching, and the preacher was talking to his son and me. <laughs> and he said, you know, I see a lot of things in the past life. I wish I'd done differently. He'd been a preacher since he was a teenager. But he said, I've come to realize, and he was in his late 40s then, he said, I've come to realize that probably if I hadn't made those decisions that weren't that good, and I can look back and say I know they weren't, even if I chose other ways to do something or not do it or who I did it with, I probably would have made mistakes in those areas too, and I've come to know that because I'm a human being, and that's the way it works. Well, it doesn't mean that you can't get better, and that's the point that we wouldn't have this sermon or we wouldn't be living the Christian life. We wouldn't be praying. We wouldn't be encouraging one another to pray scripture, learning how to pray. We wouldn't be reading the Bible because we want to change and become more like Christ. Notice what Paul had to say regarding at least some of what he said in Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Here's what Paul said of himself. He said, I was before, before he was a Christian, a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. All we have to do is read what he did as a persecutor of Christians to know what he had had in his life before he obeyed the gospel of Christ. And that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief, he told Timothy in 1 Timothy 1, 13 and 15. Well, if Paul could first of all receive forgiveness through proper attitude of heart and obedience to the truth, you can, I can, and everybody else can. Now, it is true the longer one lives a life of sin and the very nature of some sins and you've developed yourself, it gets to the point where you're unwilling to give up all that due to the uproar it would make in your life to obey the gospel. But nevertheless, uh, that's not saying that those sins won't be forgiven if you will do what God said. Paul was not willing, and notice the free moral agency. He was not willing to ruin his present service to God or to blight his future, if you would, with some sort of futile mourning and worrying over mistakes and failures of the past. He also wouldn't let the great accomplishments he did for Christ cause him to rest, as we want to say, on our laurels and say, well, look what I've done. I don't need to do any more. I've already done it. No, as long as we're capable of serving God and we're capable of living the Christian life, then I don't care whether we're 100 or whatever the age is, we do what we can according to our several ability in keeping the commandments of God. But it's a matter of fact that the Scripture makes it clear that people as early as possible, young people, ought to obey the gospel. 
because they can get themselves into habits that form a character that makes it so easy to reject the gospel later on. There are a host of people who stumble and almost fall under guilty consciences they've borne for years. But we ought to remember what Peter by inspiration wrote when he penned, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. He says, casting all your care upon him. Why? For he careth for you. 1 Peter 5, 7. Now here's where you have to grow up. And it means growing up in love of God, love of Christ, love of his word. And then grow up in faith, trust and confidence in God, Christ, and his word, which means we have to believe that he does care for us. And we have to shorten our conduct. And we have to believe that because he cares for us, then we can cast every care, every anxious thing, every worry, we can cast it upon him. Our failure to leave our load of cares with the Lord is really a sign for us that we need to grow in faith. Now, to overcome such anxieties, there's going to have to be a repentant attitude. You never hear people say much, well, if you're so full of nervous anxiety, don't you need to repent of that? Now, I'm not talking about if you have physical problems or whatever that you can't handle, you can't control, or whatever. That'd be like lecturing to a one-legged man how to win a race with one leg running with people who have two legs. Well, we're not talking about that kind of a, of a handicap. But we are talking about where I can do something about it. Well, sometimes it's simply having faith in God and knowing He cares for you. Your parents may care for you greatly. Your wife, husband, children, they don't care for you like God does. Whoa, you ever think that? Does that mean they care for you any less? No. <laughs> It's that they don't, they're not God, and, and they can't care for you like God cares for us. You can see one way, as far as I know, how much God cares for us, and that's just to think of the cross of Calvary. So to overcome these anxieties, we need to have a tender heart, easily recognizable when we're just getting, wringing our hands and can't stand what's happening, uh, did God intend for his children to do that? Will you ever just be flawless where it'll never be a problem? I don't think so. I think it's always growth and development just like anything else. Or you wouldn't be told to in most of the New Testament written to help us do that. But we can conquer our doubts. We can conquer them by faith and by living righteously. Just determined more than ever to say God knows what he's doing. Learning to just dismiss things from your mind. Have you ever tried that? Something you recognize for a moment's on your mind and you don't want it on there? Kick it out. <laughs> I realize you can't just kick it out like kicking a box out the door. But you can uh, have the attitude to get thee behind me, Satan. You can put your attention on something else. But it's effort. And different ones of us are going to be at different uh, places in our growth in that area. We need to learn to be content. A whole host of people out there aren't content at all. A lot of people don't know the difference in contentment and satisfaction. I'll never be satisfied in this world. But I, I can be content. Paul said, I have learned. Why do we think we don't have to learn? If such a one as Paul said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am. Now think about that. Therewith to be content. Notice what he said. Now this means he was learning this through this. I have, uh, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer and eat. Philippians 4.11. How do I put that into practice? Well, 
I don't know what the remainder of this day has in for me or whether there will be a night for me to sleep. But I know that you can start training your mind to deal with things. Now, <laughs> may very well be someday you lose your mind. Well, if that's the case, you won't be responsible then for anything. So I don't concern myself with things like that. So a Christian, and all the word Christian means, one who is of Christ, a member of the Lord's church, must cultivate the ability to, I guess we could say, ride with the tide and we must go with the flow. But that doesn't mean compromising the truth of the way we're supposed to live. It means it's going to be that way with some people. You may have in your mind right now, I want to see this person obey the gospel. But you can't make them. Or I want to see this person restored to his first love and be in duty and faithful to the Lord. And you do all you know to do, but you can't make them against their will. You want them, of course, to see the need and reason properly and will themselves to comply with the will of Christ. Notice 1 Timothy 6, 6 and 8 where Paul says to, to uh, Timothy, Godliness with contentment is great gain. Well, I always have like gain. It's the same way of saying you profited from it. You're better off now in, in this thing. And he's saying if you're a godly person and you're content with being godly, and that's all that matters, you've done what most people never do. And he says then after that, and having therefore food and raiment, let us therewith be content. First Timothy 6, 6 and 8. I'm telling you right now, there's a host of people in the church as far as possessing material things aren't any different than those out in the world. They still run and run and try to get and hold on. Well, it's not going to work because someday you'll leave it all anyway. And I don't care how good a will you have to whoever you will it to. Uh, once they get it, they'll live with it like they want to, even if you hope they would use it in serving the Lord. So I don't concern myself with things like that. I concern myself with what I have power over, that includes me, as I live this life. One of the great lessons that we all should learn is, I guess we can say, tersely given in Hebrews chapter 13, 5. And he's saying the same thing. Be content with such things as ye have. So many people aren't. They're out there grabbing for more. Now, why do we increase our blood pressure? <laughs> well, barring just physical breakdowns of some sort, there's still that attitude of the old saying that's been around a long time, a trite saying, people trying to keep up with the Joneses. And of course, the Joneses don't even know where they're going or headed. I promise you, most of them uh, have no idea of heaven or serving God or why they're here on earth in the flesh. They're just going right along with what everybody else on earth does. So why should people fret and fume even when it comes to our abilities, our abilities, when we didn't have those abilities in the first place? For example, I'll just choose this one thing. Some people can sing quite well and sing well enough to lead. Other people can't. Now, should the person who can't do that sit there and just worry himself to death because they're not good enough, maybe by the strength of their voice, whatever it might be, to be able to lead singing? That's just one simple example. But you can apply it to a whole host of things. After all, we do have different abilities. Or we might call them talents. A lot of times people overlook what they've got because they want what somebody else has that they can't have and never will have. Now, I'm talking about just natural development. We need to really pay attention to the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, 14 through 30. And here's one thing that's said in verse 15. You find that talents were given, now watch it, to every man according to his several ability. 
That doesn't mean we can't grow from one thing to another and have more ability to do something 10 years from now than we did now. But it does mean we have to recognize that people have different abilities. I'm glad it's that way. And God holds each one of us accountable for only that which we can do. I wish we'd remember that and we wouldn't worry so much. And you know, I'm not responsible for all the sins the Chinese are committing right now. I'm not responsible for all the sins that Putin has done or anybody else in Russia. I'm not responsible for any of that. And I don't know whether anybody will ever get to preach the gospel to Mr. Putin or whoever it is, wherever they are when they're pagans. Somebody somewhere might get an opportunity besides that this person put here on this earth, whoever it might be outside of Christ, also has an obligation placed upon him or her to use this life to find God. So the ideal is when the church is doing all it can to preach the gospel to every creature, then people on this earth have all the wherewithal to look to see God. How do they do it? Well, imagine how many thousands upon thousands, upon, well, millions of people can look at the various, just take a flower, and you look at the beauty of the bloom, and yet it never dawns on them to say, that evidence is all sorts of design, and there never has been a design without a designer. And you can look at umpteen things around you, everywhere you look is evidence, and nobody looks. Or they don't see what they look at, at least like they ought to. So there is an obligation placed upon those outside of Christ to use their time here to look for him, to find him, to be mindful of such things. And there's a responsibility of the church to preach the gospel. So he doesn't, God doesn't, require us to measure up to others. And we're forbidden from making that kind of comparison when you read 2 Corinthians 10, 12. Usually it works like this. Well, I know I'm all right because I'm as good as Brett. Brett, I hope you're real good. <laughs> and a lot of the times it goes like this, not necessarily with Brett, but you pick the person that's the weakest in the faith and say, well, I'm as good as he is. That's no way. Look at Jesus Christ and the truth of his word and say, that's what I measure up to. Let me examine myself in the light of his truth and see what I need to do. Because we're all at different growths and developments. Even all faithful people are at different degrees of growth and development in Christ. The saints in Antioch did some giving of their means. And it said, every man according to his ability determined to send relief unto the brethren, which also they did, Acts 11, 29, 30. Moving over to our U.S. dollars, maybe somebody gave $5, maybe somebody gave 25 cents, maybe somebody gave $10, maybe somebody 100. But as they gave according to their several ability, it was perfectly acceptable. The Corinthians were told it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according as he hath not, 2 Corinthians 8, 12. So remember, if it's in your power to do, worrying's not going to help you do it. And if it's not within your power, then all the worry you can give to it is wasting energy and not accomplishing anything, but just works on you in a bad way. Now, part of how to handle this, and it's something we learn, is living just one single solitary day at a time. Jesus taught that in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, verse 34. Now, I want you to notice 34 comes after 33. That's a great revelation. But what's said in verse 33? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness all these things shall be added unto you. And then take no thought, that is, don't be anxious for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Matthew 6, 34. If you live through this day faithful to the Lord, you're as ready as you're ever going to be for whatever tomorrow comes. If it comes, 
one day it won't come. And as we're faithful today and it doesn't come for us, then you're ready to leave and go to eternity. So our fretting, fuming, and stewing over future improbabilities can lead to insanity. It does all the time to one degree or the other or something. I don't care how they specifically diagnose certain things. It does. I was looking through channels to watch something, and I spend more time turning off things than I do sticking on things. But there was one show, I walked it long enough to where before I turned it off, they said this. <laughs> fellow was going to a place to visit a woman, and it was what used to be called a sanitarium. I don't know where, a sanatorium. I don't know where they call those things that anymore. <laughs> before that, they were just insane asylums. But anyway, he was going there to vis vis visit a person. And as he came on to the campus-like place, there's a woman dressed very nice. She wasn't elaborately dressed, just normal, very pleasant. And she came up to him and said, we've been waiting for you. He said, oh? He said, yes, we've been waiting for you all afternoon. He said, well, I just got here. She said, oh, well, I just want you to know we've been waiting to welcome you. And he says, are you a doctor? And she says, no. Well, are you a nurse? She says, no. So, well, who are you? I'm a paranoid schizophrenic. <laughs> After that, it did some other things that made me turn it off. But anyway, I thought that's pretty good. <laughs> Which tells you you can be intellectual enough to know what your mental problem is and then set about to correct it. And nothing wrong with that. You know, you got a broken arm, you know what you need to do, then you know when you can recognize symptoms of other things. Sometimes people can be so uh, messed up that you can. I understand that. You can't deal with Alzheimer's people the same way you would others, you just can't. It's not there to deal with. Problems, though, do not pyramid into insurmountable, staggering mountains when we live one day at a time dealing with the evil that comes this day. That's a very important point to learn as we learn how to get over this. And I guarantee you in this room, people are at different degrees of growth and development in that area. But, and it may be harder for some than others. That's not the point. Let me give you an example in the area of morals. We're hearing all sorts of things, and homosexuals are normal folks and all that. No, they're perverted. But among men, and I'll just take men for example, there may be some that are more feminine inclined. I've seen people like that. But it's no excuse to violate the Bible in what you do because I don't believe that most people are forced mentally into something they don't want to do. Homosexuality, as you read about in the Bible, is a moral sin and people can repent of it and turn from it. Some of the church at Corinth had done that. Well, when you, you think of that, a person can recognize that they may have more of affinity as a man for being feminine. That just means that person has to work that much harder to bring one subje in subjection to Christ's teaching on what it is to be a male and claim to be true toward a female. But when you let those things go and cultivate those things, then you develop into those things and build a character in those things and you go that route. People don't want to hear that nowadays. They don't want to hear that at all. But regardless of whether they hear it or not or whether they believe it or not, that's the way we work on a lot of levels, a lot of things. There was a time when nobody was supposed to be left-handed. It was thought just terrible for a person to be left-handed. And they would even make their kids uh, use the right hand. Maybe even tying their hand behind their back or some way so they couldn't use it to force them to be right-handed. Well, by nature, they were left-handed. But you know, when they made them do that and forced them into using that right hand and would not let them use the left hand, guess what they became? Right-handed. Now, that's a physical thing, but by nature, they were left-handed. But they forced them to go against what nature gave them, and they became right-handed. Well, that's not a sin. Maybe silly, but it's not a sin. And so it is with a lot of things. You may be inclined to all sorts of things. And that inclination may not be good. 
But if you know the mind of your Savior, you can do something about it. You can work on it. And that's the reason we're to love one another in the church. Can you imagine those homosexuals who obeyed the gospel in Corinth? They just snapped their fingers and ceased to have those appetites that they had cultivated? I doubt it. But it shows you that if you want to obey Christ, you can. And the state of grace is to be in Christ where you can continue to develop and grow. You need to keep yourself busy too. In other words, you need to shun idleness. Take your mind off of things. Mama used to come in and say, get out and get to do something. She would say, don't get the mully grubs. I never knew what the mully grubs were, but the best I can define it, it means, <laughs> it means stay in here and start worrying about stuff. Well, I never knew I was a worrier, but I guess she knew something about training me not to become one. That is, a worrier in the sense that just bore down on me. I think everybody's had to deal with, oh, I'm worrying. <laughs> I have to do something about it. Uh, one observation that is noted in various medical books is that immorality and crime has been promoted by, you might find this strange, the 40-hour work week and coffee breaks. What do you mean? Well, idle hands are the devil's workshop. It means the more idle we get, the more we get into trouble. That's all that's trying to say. And when we don't have anything to do, we ought to make something to do. Uh, listen to what's said in 1 Timothy 5.13. Paul teaching Timothy what Timothy ought to teach the brethren. And withal they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, not only idle, but tattlers also and busybodies, speaking things they ought not to. Well, he's talking about women there. If a woman really minds the house, God put her in charge or to do her business. And in those days, there wasn't much business of a wife outside keeping the home. Then she's not going to have time to get in trouble. That's what it amounts to. Well, it works that way for the man not doing what ought to be. So folks can worry themselves to death, literally, but... Uh, reasonable amount of work doesn't kill anybody. In 2 Thessalonians 5.10, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any will not work, neither should he eat. Do you realize what a revolution and upheaval there would be in our government and in the society in which we live today if everybody was fed on the basis of their work ethic? It would be a total revolution because so many people get something for nothing and they're never trained except that we ought to get something for nothing. Honest toil has never hurt anyone. Listen to God's instructions. It's simple how they did things then. Go to the ant. Thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. Proverbs 6, verses 6 through 8. So one of the ways to overcome anxiety and worry is to keep busy in useful labor. That sums it all up. Then make whatever handicap you think you've got, though that person today is not allowed to be labeled a handicapped person but a challenged person what is a challenged person a handicapped person uh, many have given severe handicaps literally Moses rose from a sub subjugated people to achieve greatness Abraham came from an adulterous land his father worshipped idols. But he became such a faithful servant of God, he's pictured as the father of the faithful and the friend of God. And then there's Saul of Tarsus we've mentioned already, a very bold persecutor of Christians. And he referred to his sinful past in 1 Corinthians 15, 9, and 1 Timothy 1, 13 through 15. 
Well, after he turned then in repentance to the Lord and obedience to the truth, do you remember him talking about, I still got a handicap, I wish I could get rid of it? A thorn in the flesh, and we know not what it was, but he wanted to be rid of it. But the Lord said, that's one thing that's helping you be what you pray to be. It's about having to deal with that handicap. My grace is sufficient for thee. There was given me, he wrote, given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9. We don't look at things that way. We want through with it. We want to get rid of it. But Paul didn't. He said, I'm going to let this thing cause me to be closer to the Lord. So we have to learn how to use certain things, don't we? So a handicap can be either a stumbling stone or a stepping stone. You know, they said of Paul, as he wrote at least, his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible, 2 Corinthians 10, 10. I don't ever see anything the Bible indicates he worried about that. But he said, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. 1 Corinthians 15, 10. I don't think sometimes we realize these men had struggles just like everybody else and sometimes far greater struggles than we'll face in a whole lifetime. And I just simply, without reading it, urge you to read 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 12. And chapter 11, verses 23 through 28, along those lines, as Paul really referred to himself in teaching lessons. In these passages, you'll see how Paul faced what we would call handicaps in the various trials, and he did so without worry. I don't know all how God does what he does. I don't pretend to. I've always taught people you don't have to know. I just see the people at the, dead, at the Red Sea as God parts the waters and they all stay on there arguing with one another and wondering and having a class on how did God do that and never get across the sea. <laughs> or at the Jordan River entering the land of promise, how did that happen? And so they never crossed. No, you don't see that. It's not even talked about. They knew God did it and they acted accordingly. And then the other thing, and it'll be the last point, that overcoming anxiety and worry. God's your partner. Now, we've alluded to that already, and you have to accept that fact. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 1, we then, as workers together with him, beseech you, beg you, I'm on bended knee begging, that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. Well, I recognize the apostles had a role to fulfill. Nobody else did. But at the same time, we must realize, as we started out, God cares for us. Jesus cares for us. He cares for you. Cast all your cares upon him. Well, that's as important and as true as Acts 2, verse 38. To the believer, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Paul had this assurance. Because here's what he said. For we are laborers together with God. 1 Corinthians 3, 9. Well, ask yourself the question. Are you a labor together with Jesus Christ or God? You're a member of his church. Are you faithful? That's the way you labor together with him. So how can we just remain fretting and fuming and worrying and anxious over problems when God is our partner and he careth for us and we're told by him to lay every care upon him? Having God with us should be Enough to remove all the worrisome doubts and fears. Peter wrote this, and we'll be through, 1 Peter 5 and 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. Why? That ye may exalt, that he may exalt you in due time. Here he says it again, casting all your care upon him. For he care for you. So we're right back where we started, and that's the place to end, is where you start when it comes to learning about worry 
and anxiety and care and how to get rid of it and what God wants us to be and where we need to aim as we live righteous lives before God. And to make life a lot easier here doesn't mean we don't have something to work on. I've said that already. But because God said we can, then we can. If you're not a child of God, we urge you this evening or this afternoon to obey the gospel of Christ by believing in Christ, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Him, and being baptized for the remission of sins, to live a righteous life in the church, to grow up in all things, and especially what we just studied this afternoon. As a child of God, where are you in serving God? How much have you grown and developed? Have you been following the rule of forgetting those things which are behind and pressing forward to the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus? Or are you just, I guess you'd say, wallowing in the mud hold of doubt and all that? God never wants that. Whatever your situation is, are you faithful to God in the church? If you need to obey the truth to be forgiven of sins as a child of God, repent of them. That's all done in the mind and poured forth in the actions. Repent of them. Confess those sins and pray God for forgiveness. If you need to obey the truth, we invite you to come while we stand, while we sing.